Good afternoon and welcome to this symposium entitled Enhanced Hypotension Management with Predictive Monitoring, sponsored by Edwards Life Sciences. My name is Thomas Scheer and I'm a professor of anesthesiology at the Universal Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands, and I will be chairing this uh, symposium. In the symposium, uh, we will discuss hypotension and hypotension management, both in the OR and in the ICU, since it resembles the continuous treatment path of a patient. And furthermore, it's in line with the new name of the Society, European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. So we will have uh, four excellent speakers. I'm looking forward to their talks. We will listen to the talks first, that is the idea, and then have the discussion at the end. So please submit your questions, um, uh, which we'll then uh, forward to the speakers at the end. So the first talk uh, will be given by my good friend, uh, Professor Bernd Saugel from Hamburg, and he will bring us all on the same page by talking about the incidence of hypertension in the OR and in the ICU. Please, Bernd, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Bernd Saugel. In this first talk of the session on perioperative blood pressure management, we want to discuss the incidence of hypertension during and after surgery. These are my conflicts of interest. So I will continue here. So our awareness towards interoperative blood pressure and that hypertension is a problem increased massively during the last decades. And now I have remote control. So if we go back in time and go back to 1951, there was the annual Congress of anesthetists in London and there was a session on the risks and benefits of hypertension. And when we read in the summary of this Congress, we will find a statement that a systolic blood pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury is safe in young and healthy patients. And that a reduction to 70 millimeters of mercury is all that is necessary, though that the technique appears to provide a good safety margin. This is something we wouldn't recommend today. Only almost 30 years later, there was the first study showing that there are factors independently associated with postoperative cardiac death, and that these factors included an uh, unplanned 33 or greater reduction, reduction in systolic blood pressure for more than 10 minutes during surgery. In 1990, there was a landmark study that showed that prolonged changes uh, of mean arterial pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury or 20% in relation to the preoperative level were significantly associated with complications. In the last 10 or 20 years, more and more centers all over the world started using electronic anesthesia records. And using electronic anesthesia records now allows us to have and to analyze large databases with blood pressure data. So therefore, one could assume that it is very easy to answer the question, is intraoperative hypotension common? A reasonable question then, of course, is how to define intraoperative hypotension. And the problem is that the incidence of intraoperative hypotension is a function of the chosen definition, as has been shown in this classic paper. In this paper, authors report um, about the hypotension definitions in 130 papers on intraoperative hypotension published in the major journals. And what they found, they found 140 definitions of hypotension. Naturally, depending on the definition, the incidence of hypotension varied substantially and it varied between 0.7 to 99%. There are numerous others, other ways to quantify the amount of intraoperative hypertension. And for example, there is the absolute, absolute maximum decrease in millimeters of mercury below certain blood pressure thresholds. You can calculate the total duration of hypertensive episodes, for example, in minutes. Physiologically more important is the total area under a threshold. So it's the sum of the orange uh, areas in this figure. Or you can normalize this to the duration of surgery and then you will end up with the time weighted average mean arterial pressure that is the total area under a threshold divided by the duration of surgery. All of this 
makes clear that hypotension is a function of hypotension severity and hypotension duration. This has been also shown in this study on the relationship between intraoperative mean arterial pressure and postoperative clinical outcomes. And as you can see here, if you define hypotension as a mean arterial pressure of less than 55, then increasing durations of hypotension are associated with increasing risks for acute um, kidney injury and also for acute myocardial injury. And if we look at this figure, we can see that the risk for developing postoperative myocardial injury or acute kidney injury increases when the lowest mean arterial pressure for a cumulative five minutes during surgery is lower than 60 to 65. This, of course, is only true for a population and not for an individual patient. Nevertheless, at the moment, it is safe to say that there is evidence from retrospective registry analysis that the intraoperative population harm threshold for organ injury is around 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury for mean arterial pressure. And it is also reasonable to recommend to keep blood pressure above 65. The problem with hypotension is that it not only occurs during surgery, so it is also a problem before and even more after surgery. A couple of years ago, we already showed that there are different phases of intraoperative hypotension, namely post-induction hypotension just, just after the induction of general anesthesia, early intraoperative hypotension, and late intraoperative hypotension. So this showed us that there is intraoperative hypotension even before surgery starts, and that there are different causes for intraoperative hypotension depending on the different phases. The problem of post-induction hypotension was uh, also part of this study. And in this study, authors looked for the proportion of hypotensive duration before surgical incision and after surgical incision. And interestingly, about one third of hypotension occurs before surgical incision, before the surgeon even enters the OR. And of course, not only hypotension after, uh, after surgical incision, but also hypotension before surgical incision is associated with acute kidney injury because the kidneys do not care when hypotension occurs. Hypotension is also a problem after surgery on the normal ward. And this is an interesting sub-study of the POIS-2 trial. And here we can see that hypotension was defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 requiring treatment. And 35% of patients had intraoperative hypotension, hypotension during surgery. More than 30% of the patients also had hypotension on the remaining day of surgery. And almost 8% of the patients had hypotension on postoperative days one to four. Interestingly, there was new onset hypotension. That means that patients were hypotensive on the remaining day of surgery or on postoperative days one to four who were not hypotensive during surgery. If we look at the association between hypotension during those different phases and the risk for myocardial injury and death, you can here see the odds ratio for 10 and 30 minutes of intraoperative hypotension, 10 and 30 minutes of hypertension on the remaining day of surgery, and this is the odds ratio for any hypotension on the remaining, uh, on the postoperative days one to four. This is another study on postoperative hypotension on normal wards. And here you can see the continuous 15, 30, or 60 minutes below certain blood pressure thresholds. And for example, we can conclude that more than 10%, uh, almost 15% of the patients have more than 30 continuous minutes with a mean arterial pressure of 65. Again, a study on postoperative hypertension, and this time in more than 1,700 non cardiac surgery patients who were treated in a high dependency unit for the first 24 hours after surgery. And again, postoperative hypotension was common. About 10% of the patients had two cumulative hours with a mean arterial pressure of less than 60, 
and about half of the patients had four cumulative hours with a mean arterial pressure of less than 75. Again, postoperative hypotension was associated with postoperative myocardial injury. The same is true in the ICU, and I will not so much focus on ICU hypertension because this will be covered in uh, one of the next talks, but this is a study in more than 2,800 patients admitted to the ICU after non-cardiac surgery. And not surprisingly, again, we can see that hypotension is common. A lot of patients have hypotensive episodes with mean arterial pressures of less than 70, 65, or 60. And again, hypertension was associated with an increased risk for acute kidney injury and for a composite of myocardial injury and mortality. It is important though to notice that population harm thresholds for organ injury seem to be a little bit higher than during the interoperative period with harm thresholds, well, around, let's say 75. So postoperative hypertension is also common and is prolonged because we don't recognize it on the normal board. Postoperative harm thresholds remain largely unknown, but they are probably a little bit higher than intraoperative harm thresholds. So I'm happy to conclude that hypotension during and after surgery, first of all, is common and it is associated with organ injury. There is no clear definition of physiologically relevant hypotension. But one thing is sure, hypotension is a function of duration and severity when we look at the association or perhaps even the causality between hypotension and postoperative organ injury. Intraoperative population harm thresholds are about 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury for mean arterial pressure, and postoperative harm thresholds remain largely unknown. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bern, for this excellent talk uh, and, and bringing us on the same page uh, on the incidence of hypotension. Um, and sorry for the technical uh, problems that we have. This is an, a live event, and, and these things happen uh, even after such a long time of uh, technical conferencing. Um, we will not have a discussion right now. Um, as, as I said, if you have questions, please put it into the Slido, and we will collect them and address them at the end. And having said that, I would like to introduce another very good friend of mine, Michael Sander. Professor Michael Sander is um, uh, head of the Department of Anesthesiology in Gießen, and he will uh, tell us about the underlying mechanism leading to hypertension, because not every hypertension is the same. Please, Michael. Thank you, Thomas. Um, nice to be here, even if it's only virtual still at the moment. So we will talk within the next 10 minutes a little bit about underlying mechanism leading to hypertension. You see here my disclosures. And we start with a quite old guy and the Ohm's law, which we all know from going to school some years ago. And basically this law says that the current through a conductor between two points is directly proportional to the voltage across the two points or the amperage equals voltage divided by resistance. And also for us as anesthetists and intensivists, this law is important because we know that the resistance equals pressure divided by flow. And if we solve that to the systemic vascular resistance, we learn that this equals the difference between mean arterial blood pressure and central venous pressure divided by cardiac output. And it's quite easy for us to solve this to mean arterial blood pressure. And we see that this is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance plus central venous pressure. And to make it a little bit easier, we see the mean arterial blood pressure we measure in our patients is mainly influenced by cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. 
So if we use that formula here, and as we know that in a lot of organ systems, we have autoregulation, we see the blood flow within certain limits is constant, but if the blood flow decreases or increases, then there is an increase in flow and there is a range of mean arterial pressure that is important for our patients. So if we look at the pressure curve and the variables we can identify in that pressure curve, we see the systolic blood pressure is influenced by left ventricular stroke volume, vascular compliance, and backward reflected waves. The pulse pressure, so the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic pressure um, and the, the way in between, closely reflect stroke volume. And the mean arterial pressure, so the average pressure of the cardiac cycle, is the inflow pressure for most organ systems. And finally, the diastolic blood pressure, which is mainly influenced by systemic vascular resistance, is the pressure the left ventricle must overcome to begin injecting blood into the artery, and is also important because that's the pressure the heart has to work against it um, the whole period. And this is from a study or from, from a paper from, from Bernd Saugel, we heard um, just now speaking, that if we look at hypertension and blood pressures, it's not so easy because it's influenced by a lot of factors, um, as we heard, mainly cardiac output and vascular resistance. But we know that cardiac output is also influenced by heart rate, stroke volume, and fluid status. And in this a little bit older review article, um, it is shown that hypertension has different root causes. So in this table, we see hypertension is mainly resulting from the parameter heart rate, preload, afterload, and contractility. So in some patients, the heart rate is too low. And in some patients, we as anesthetists and intensivists might be responsible due to drug interaction. And in some patients, heart rate is quite high, um, which is also a problem for some patients because of reduced diastolic filling time. Obviously, preload has an important factor on the um, mean arterial blood pressure or the blood pressure in total. Um, so in, in some patients, we have inadequate intravascular fluid status. In some patients, we have bleeding and other problems. And then afterload, um, often in anesthesia procedures, due to the drugs we use, we have artificial low systemic vascular resistance, but there are also other causes of low systemic vascular resistance you can see here. And then in some patients, we have reduced contractility resulting from cardiomyopathy, myocardial ischemia, ischemia valvular dysfunction, or even volunteer anesthetics or other causes of reduced contractility. So if we look at clinical examples we see in our patients, so some causes of perioperative hypertension is due to hypovolemia. Some are due to the usage of drugs we give. Some are to um, the regional anesthesia and the associated vasodilation or bradycardia or in special situations, the carbon compression syndrome. Others to intraoperative incidents. I guess everybody has seen vagal reflexes with severe bradycardia or other problems. And finally, importantly, cardiopulmonary complications like tension, pneumothorax, hematothorax, or other of these complications we encounter during and after surgery. So this gives. Um, an idea 
what we can do about hypertension. Um, well, the main and most important issue is the medical or immediate history of the patient and uh, treat the underlying cause. So for example, if we find out that the anesthesia depth for this time of surgery and band nicely showed that one third of hypertension um, is detectable before the surgeon enters the room. So the problem might be too deep anesthesia before the surgical stimulus. Obviously then a good idea would be to target anesthesia depth. Um, in, in the beginning, obviously, if uh, we have uh, beginning hypertension, it's probably not a good idea to give additional boluses of propofol. Or in, in patients being um, hypertensive, it might not be the best idea to start the, the epidural full dose um, before sort of getting the fluid status all right. After we optimized all things that we can optimize outside of the hemodynamic system, then it makes sense to look at the fluid status uh, to optimize the volume status of our patients. Then when we are sure that this is in the optimum, then we can have a look at the contractility, um, which is quite difficult because we don't have good normal values for our patients. And if you look in studies, um, different authors uh, use different cutoffs for the right cardiac output or right cardiac index for our patients or the right stroke volume index. And in the end, we have to look at the, the systemic vascular resistance and sort of normalize that to treat hypertension. And just as a final remark, when we talk about treating hypertension um, and optimizing patients, it seems to be quite complicated to prevent hypertension. Um, as we see here from a study done with um, done by, by our chair, Thomas Schern, together with Simon Davis in two centers where the authors were quite optimistic as they used in all their high-risk patients, goal-directed fluid therapy and, and advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Even in this selected cohort, hypertension was still detectable. So in, in, in those two centers, they had 86% hypertension incidence and patients spent uh, uh, really a substantial time in hypertension. So it will be interesting um, how to tackle that. But I like to conclude that um, we saw there are many reasons why patients develop hypertension. The most important reasons is probably hypovolemia, decreased contractility and low systemic vascular resistance in our patients. And we have to look at those parameters closely in our patients to treat hypertension or to prevent it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for showing us the different mechanisms uh, underlying hypertension. And as I said, uh, please put your questions into the slide or we will uh, discuss them uh, at the end of uh, after the last uh, speak uh, talk. Uh, with that, I'm very excited to um, announce uh, a, a young doctor, Dr. Carla Grundmann from uh, Herne, and she will take us um, to, through the dealing of hypertension in the OR, best practices and clinical outcomes, uh, and she will report about her findings of a study that they did there in Herne. Please. Hello and welcome again. My name is Carla Grunman. I'm a resident at Marine Hospital Herne in Germany. At first, I would like to thank for the opportunity to see attention in the OR, best practices and clinical outcomes. Hemodynamic monitoring varies from non-invasive blood pressure measurements to pulmonary artery catheters. The big question is, what is best for our individual patient? So, do we really need extensive and expensive hemodynamic monitoring? 
The answer in our clinic was probably not, because our patients are not that hypotensive. As you heard from Professor Sauge before, the incidence of perioperative hypertension varies immensely, so we presumed we would be on the lower end. We used the arterial waveform analysis for four weeks without using the advantages, but continuing usual care in 13 patients, and these are the results. All patients had at least one hypertensive event. The lowest mean arterial pressure in all patients was 31 mm of mercury, and with a mean total duration of 37 minutes in hypotension, our patients had a time weighted average of 1.3 mm of mercury. There was no further discussion about the need of hemodynamic awareness and monitoring. The significance of this analysis is of course limited, but it worked as a wake-up call for us. The time-weighted average of 1.3 mm of mercury doesn't sound so bad. Well, let's put it into perspective again. The time-weighted average is calculated by the area under threshold, in most cases a mean arterial pressure below 65 mm of mercury, divided by surgery time. In this first example, one hypertensive event occurred with a duration of 1.7 minutes during five and a half hours of surgery. The calculated time-weighted average is 0.04 mm of mercury. Hence, this patient has only had a short time in hypertension, below 1% of surgery time, so 0.04 is a very low value for time-weighted average. In the second example, you can easily spot the hypertensive events marked in red. There are seven events adding up to 40 minutes of hypertension during two hours of surgery. The calculated time-weighted average is 2.27 mm of mercury. This patient was not only hypertensive during one-third of surgery time, but the mean arterial pressure decreased to 45 mm of mercury several times. Hence, a time-weighted average of 2.27 mm of mercury is very high. Moving on to predictive monitoring. The Hypertension Prediction Index, short HPI, is based on a machine learning algorithm and uses arterial waveform analysis. It appears as a scaleless number from 0 to 100 on the monitor. The higher the number is, the higher is the risk for an imminent hypertensive event. In the last four years, multiple studies around the topic of HPI were published. In different study settings, the abilities and limitations of the HPI were shown. At first, the HPI was only used in combination with invasive blood pressure monitoring with an arterial line, but since 2020, there's also research with the non-invasive usage of HPI. This is just one example of the so-called secondary screen of HPI. You can see the index up in the middle, 34 at the moment, which symbolizes a lower risk for hypertension in the upcoming minutes. So we can all relax for now. Just below, you can see the current measurement for the mean arterial pressure, 85 mm mercury, and further down, the calculations, plus the 10-minute change. The different calculated parameters allow the distinction in the underlying causes preload, cardiac contractility, and afterload. We conducted a retrospective analysis of 100 non-cardiac surgical patients in two groups. We tested the hypothesis that the clinical application of the HPI combined with a personalized treatment protocol reduces the incidence and severity of perioperative hypertension in comparison to arterial waveform analysis with the flow track sensor. Following ethical approval, we analyzed data from 100 consecutive patients over 11 months undergoing major abdominal surgery with hemodynamic monitoring with either flow track or HPI sensor. The clinicians were not knowingly part of a study, thus acted in their usual way with guidance from our standard operating procedures. It is stated that the first hemodynamic goal is keeping the mean arterial pressure above at least 65 mm of mercury. The primary endpoint was the incidence and severity of hypertension defined as a mean arterial pressure below 65 mm of mercury for one minute evaluated by time-weighted average. How does the secondary screen help you providing good care for your patient? As the algorithm and interpretation is quite complex, 
We use this goal-directed therapy protocol for the patients in our study. It is adapted from my Schwarian colleagues. As you can see, every possible combination of parameters leads to a recommendation for therapy. For example, if the HPI alarms and the stroke volume variation is above 20% and there's no sign of decrease in afterload or contractility, the underlying cause is probably preload. Hence, the patient in sinus rhythm needs fluids. The evaluation on the demographic data showed in over 30 characteristics no statistical significant difference in between flow track and HPI group. There was no difference in age, ASA classification, the anesthetist's experience, surgical approach, antihypertensive medication or pre-existing conditions. This shows a good comparability of the groups. The time-weighted average of hypertension below a mean arterial pressure of 65 mm of mercury was the primary endpoint. Regarding the time-weighted average in the first analysis of 1.3 mm of mercury, we were quite surprised about the following results. The median time-weighted average was 0.266 mm of mercury in the flow track group compared to 0.1 mm of mercury in the HPI group, which is a highly significant difference between groups. This single center retrospective observatory study shows that the clinical appliance of the prediction index indeed reduces incidence and severity of intraoperative hypertension compared to a two waveform analysis alone. As far as secondary endpoints were concerned, we could show that not only the absolute number of hypertensive events was reduced from 251 to 58 events in the index-guided group, but that it was possible to reduce the overall time spent in hypertension significantly, from 22.7 minutes to 3.3 minutes. Furthermore, the incidence of the even more dangerous hypertensive events with a mean arterial pressure below 50 millimeters of mercury was significantly reduced in the HPI group. Best clinical practice. What did we learn from one year of experience? After finishing these first 50 patients with the protocol, we took our own observations into consideration. We kept the primary goal of mean arterial pressure and stroke volume variation, but adjusted the cardiac index to a higher level in accordance with the IPEGASUS trial. As you can see in this picture, the alarm appears often just shortly before the hypertensive event. This is why you usually do not have time to wait for fluid bolus to treat an upcoming hypertensive event, even though it is the right therapy according to the flow chart. As a solution, we included the pragmatic immediate vasopressor therapy as a step before the causal therapy. Furthermore, we considered the dynamic change of HPI, mean arterial pressure, stroke volume variation, and cardiac index as a trigger to start the process of goal-directed therapy to actually prevent hypertensive events. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Grundmann, for sharing your experience uh, with the HPI uh, monitoring the hypertension prediction index in the IC uh, in the perioperative setting. And uh, we will just now listen to the last talk of this symposium, um, which uh, is about hypertension management in the ICU, um, and it's given by Professor Alexander Fla. Um, please, Alexander, um, give your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and being here and to talk about hypertension management in the ICU time to change. I'm waiting, yes, for the remote control, it works. So um, first of all, of course, my conflicts of interest um, is uh, funding and consultancy uh, uh, by Edwards Life Sciences. Um, but to go to the agenda, hypertension in the ICU, current opinion and management, HPI, it was already uh, nicely introduced by the previous speakers, but what is it uh, and could it be for uh, us in the ICU? 
and how should we have a protocol uh, fit to the ICU. So instance of hypertension in the ICU, it was already introduced. Um, um, uh, it is present, uh, but it is even uh, uh, better to measure it yourself. Uh, I can recommend it to all of you uh, because um, it is much more than you previous expected to be there. Um, we uh, performed a uh, prospective study in a general ICU population, and we did approximately seven to eight hour observation in the first time of admission. And then only 25% did not suffer from hypertension. In this setting, we defined hypertension as a blood pressure below 65 millimeters mercury for more than one minute. 75% had hypertension with a duration of 52 minutes. Um, and of course, uh, we will get discussion whether 65 below just is a problem. Uh, we know it is associated, as already introduced in the initial talks, with onset of AKI uh, morbidity, mortality in the ICU. But also this patient group suffered from hypertension below 55 and even 45 of millimeters mercury. So, and what happens when hypertension occurs in the ICU? In general, there is often a wait and see what you see here. With 20 patients, we did an intensive monitoring with um, uh, researchers really focusing on what was done when the blood pressure dropped below 65. Um, uh, and what you see is that and the majority is a wait and see. Um, and with uh, 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 after that, uh, facial pressure being given as the next step. Um, so there needs to be a, a change. So there is need for a time to change. Um, and that's because we know that this blood pressure below 65 is associated with acute kidney injury, myocardial injury, mortality. And this association is of course stronger when the depth uh, is, is more and the duration is longer. So, is it something what we only think we, we are speaking here all about it? We are we are really focused on the topic. Uh, are we living in a bubble with only thinking that we should tackle this problem or uh, what is the rest of the world thinking about it? So that's why we performed um, uh, this survey international for ICU physician and nurses worldwide. And here you see it's a nice coverage, I think, of the worldwide uh, way of dealing with hypertension. And First of all, we wanted to know what is the threshold people use in the ICU? Well, um, you can, of course, do an absolute, you can do a relatively, and you can, of course, use systolic uh, map or diastolic. But what you see is the majority uses a threshold, uses the map, and uses an absolute value. And then, of course, what is the general um, uh, uh, target uh, or threshold? And that is what you see here, 65. And that's also uh, uh, the same for nurses and for doctors. Um, and it's interesting that the majority of physicians and nurses finds its underdiagnosis uh, 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 being an important part of hypertension. And also what they say, we think it is preventable by the majority uh, uh, in, in their cases. And furthermore, they even agree on that it's associated with an increase in length of stay, morbidity and mortality, and mainly in the older patients. So um, what we see here is that everybody worldwide, or at least this sample of worldwide, agrees on that hypertension in the ICU is a serious problem. It's associated with worse outcome, and they want to do something about it. And of course, we are already thinking how to tackle that. And we think we need to go to a nurse-driven autonomously uh, uh, protocol to treat hypertension because they are the first responders and bedside at those patients. And the majority of respondents feels comfortable if we would have such an autonomous uh, uh, protocol for nurses. Um, and majority also states that they think the hypertension treatment should improve in their ICU. Of course, we were interested whether ICUs already have a protocol for hypertension treatment, and this is striking. The majority has no protocol how to deal with hypertension. And would you like one? Uh, the majority wants one. So I think we're on the right track. And if ICUs already have it, then uh, already a majority also goes to an autonomously 
uh, 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 protocol uh, for nurses. So I think also there we are at the right track. So the majority also thinks hypertension is largely preventable. And the next step is, of course, if you want to prevent it, you want to know whether a patient will develop uh, hypertension. And here, HPI could help hypertension prediction index. HPI already introduced, so I, I will not go into detail, but um, it's important to know that although the focus now is in the OR, the validation already uh, 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 and the training was uh, on a data set, including ICU patients. But further validation in the ICU uh, is, of course, needed. So that's also why we performed an external validation. Um, COVID-19 is part of the ICU, so we validated in COVID-19, but also in a mixed ICU population. So here you see uh, the rock curve for HPI COVID-19 patient in the ICU, in which you see it is really working well. Majority of patients also uh, suffered from hypertension, what you can see, and also with a duration of uh, measurements of 70 hours and a significant number of events. And here again, also the sensitivity and specificity, you know, of HPI um, uh, with an 85 is very good. And here the calibration curve with the HPI going up, the event rate also going up, showing um, that when your HPI increases, there is a high risk for an event. And also the time to events you see in seconds uh, at the HPI level of 85. If we go to a mixed ICU population, and in our setting, that is cardiac surgery, that is trauma, that's sepsis, neuro, neurosurgery, really a mixed ICU setting with 500 almost ICU patients. You see a validation similar to HATIP in anesthesiology uh, of the HPI. And here, more focused in the top uh, rock curve with a five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or 20 minutes prior to start of a hypertension. Uh, 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 event, there is also a very good uh, performance. If we go to the calibration curve here, also, if the HPI goes up, and especially with the five minutes, you see a really uh, good performance, and also with the 10 minutes uh, 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 for uh, the event rate. So this, of course, asks to the next step. So we have uh, the algorithm, we've got an internal validation, we've got an external validation in the ICU. And now of course we want to do also a trial in which we show that it cannot only predict, but if we know hypertension is coming, we can prevent or reduce it. And what we uh, uh, now uh, do is a successor of the HYPE-1. The HYPE-1 was published in YAMA in non-cardiac surgery, uh, non-ICU, um, and where what it showed that HPI uh, with diagnostic guidance versus standard care was superior. It significantly reduced uh, TWA um, and no difference. That's important, of course, in cumulative dose or type of facial pressure and fluids given to the patient. So we, prevention is better than acting when it already occurs. Here you see the TWA, but also the time of hypertension significantly reduced. So the HYPE-2, why do we do it in cardiac surgery ICU patients? Well, first of all, it is uh, uh, um, uh, a population with a high incidence of uh, uh, hypertension that, that came forward also out of our prospective study. Um, and we know, of course, that hypertension during OR and ICU is associated with increased morbidity. So we include adult patients with plant elective on pump cabbage or cabbage plus heart filth, um, plan to receive standard monitoring uh, and a target map of at least 65 millimeters mercury. So the, the treatment group uh, uh, has uh, hemisphere and in the control, it is blinded. We start after induction uh, and we stop before a pump because of course during the pump, we have no um, uh, influence with our uh, HPI. And 30 minutes after the pump till closing, uh, we uh, restart the trial again. And then at the intensive care, um, up to extubation or eight hours after admission, we continue with a follow-up of 28 days. 
And this is, I think, important. This is our treatment algorithm uh, in the uh, OR uh, with the HPI of 50 or 75. We start looking what might happen and uh, a map below 65 or HPI above 60, 75. We start with the treatment and based on the criteria, phasoplegia, hyperphalemia, or contractility issues, treatment is at the um, uh, discretion of the anesthesiologist. In the ICU, it's a bit different. Here we have a nurse-driven protocol where we really dictate already based on whether there's a preload to contractility or an afterload problem, what the nurses should do. So with a preload, they have the freedom to do two boluses of uh, fluids um, or Trendelenburg uh, uh, movements. In the setting of contractility, if Dobu already is running, they're allowed to change, but um, dobutamine needs to be consulted uh, with the physician if it's not yet running. So noradrenaline, norepherin, they, they are allowed to start and also adjust. They can do the first movement uh, with norepherin. We really think that the nurse needs to have a kind of freedom in which he or she can uh, uh, work uh, to have this direct action. That's in a way what HPI tells you. You need to act. And if you wait too long or you do not act based on your HPI, you will not see the effect you can have. Afterload, of course, with uh, uh, norepinephrine. Uh, again, with all those interventions, after two interventions, they need to consult the physician. Uh, mainly also, of course, with contractility. If you go continue while there is, for example, tamponade post cardiac surgery, uh, we need to have awareness for that. So my take home, hypertension is related with poor outcome. Hypertension is a serious problem in the ICU. I really recommend to, to measure it for yourself, to focus on it and to become aware we have a serious problem. Um, and this is also recognized by ICU professionals based on the survey we showed, and they would like to have a solution. Well, hypertension can be identified prior actual occurring. So we have a solution to identify it. Um, and I think the HYPE 2 trial will be important for clinicians, whether we are also able to reduce or to prevent even hypertension in the ICU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Excellent talk. And, and, and I'm already looking forward to seeing the results of those uh, uh, HYPE 2 trial. Um, uh, so um, we are now opening the discussion uh, for all the four talks that we had. Just a very brief uh, summary. So we heard uh, about the incidence of hypertension, uh, that it is very occurring very frequently, both uh, in the OR, but also in the ICU. Um, then we heard about the underlying uh, different uh, mechanisms leading to hypertension, which might be quite different. And then we heard uh, how to deal with the hypertension in the OR and in the ICU. And we learned that with the HPI, the Hypertension Prediction Index, that, that this works uh, in the OR, um, and, but also in the uh, ICU. And if it is uh, associated with a treatment protocol, uh, then um, it might uh, probably uh, uh, affect the outcome of our patient uh, in a positive way, because reducing hypertension might uh, improve the outcome and, and prevent uh, complications. So while we are waiting for the questions, uh, from the audience, uh, let me just start uh, with Bernd. Uh, you, you showed us that the uh, awareness of hypertension has increased over the, the recent years, but is it really recognized as a problem by our colleagues? Well, I agree with you that um, many still don't really except that there is an association between hypertension and outcomes. And well, the important thing is not understanding that there's an association, but the important is, uh, well, whether or not there is a causal relation between the two. And from my perspective, what we can safely say today is that there is an association. So hypertension, of course, never is physiological. And there, if we look at large databases retrospectively, we see that there is an association between hypertension and adverse outcomes. My, for example, myocardial injury and acute kidney injury. And we have one randomized control trial that is not robust, that is relatively small. Uh, the IMPRESS trial that shows that individually, uh, individual optimization of um, blood pressure compared to routine care 
is able to reduce the incidence of post-operative complications. So we should be aware that it's a problem. We should be aware of the association and we should be aware of limited evidence that there is a causal relationship. And this is all we can say today. I'm sure that we can do a better job in recognizing it, but we as researchers need to do a better job showing that there is actually, actually a causal relation and that blood pressure management, so changing blood pressure intervening actually makes a difference. So what do you say to those colleagues who would still accept lower blood pressures or, or even asked by the surgical colleagues to, to, to go for lower blood pressures to, to provide better operating conditions? What do you say to those conditions? Well, my personal opinion is, and there is a very strong opinion there, there is no indication for permissive hypotension, hypotension in the OR, but we need to acknowledge that if you, um, and this is hard to frame, if you have a young patient with a low baseline risk um, who has, um, let's say, a mean arterial pressure of 60 for a couple of minutes, it's very unlikely that he will suffer complications because of hypotension. But I think it's very dangerous to, um, on an individual level, think how low you can go. I think it's a good way uh, to think about it as 65 should you be your intervention threshold in every single patient. And then we need to be at a better job in identifying who needs more. Um, everything else is quite is, is speculation and maybe dangerous for the patient. Thank you. So, so a question to, to Dr. Grundmann. I, I, I'm not sure if she's uh, in the talk. I, I don't see yes. her. Yes, I'm is. here. Okay, great. Uh, so, so you you introduced to us the, the time weighted average. This is a, a a clinical, not very well known or accepted uh, a variable yet. Do you think we should uh, use this, or we should learn it uh, to use it? Because it doesn't say me tell me anything if it's 0.2 or 2.7, like like you showed us. These are not numbers that we are uh, used to. What, what do you think? How should we adopt to this? Uh, numbers? These numbers for time weighted average are math mathematical. So they're after the surgery, during surgery, during usage of HPI in OR or, in or intensive care unit, you cannot use these measurements. But the HPI itself, it's just, it's one another number, one other measurement that you can use in daily care. You have other variables you use like central venous pressure or um, heart rate that you can use instead of HPI or in addition to HPI. It's not one thing you need. It's just one point from a whole lot in hypertension management. I'm just thinking about using it as a, a sort of, of benchmarking uh, to, to evaluate. Dr. A is having a time weighted average of the 1.0 and the other 3.0 during for the same kind of operation. So this could be a nice way to to evaluate the performance of uh, of this. But anyway, this yes. is a, just yes, a, our, chief, a our chief actually did that, and um, okay. this was, that was like a good motivational point for us because there was a, a good competition going on. Excellent. Uh, coming back to Bernd, you also showed us in your talk that hypertension does not occur only during the operation, but also before, so after induction, for example, and also postoperatively. These are typically uh, phases where the, we don't always have adequate or continuous monitoring of the patient, for example, continuous blood pressure monitoring by an interior line. So what should, do we have to change our, our monitoring in ex particularly in these periods? Yeah, that is a good question. I think for the post induction period, it's uh, a problem with a very easy solution. So there are already data that uh, non invasive continuous monitoring can reduce hypotension after induction of anesthesia. And if you have a patient where you see an indication for an anterior catheter, there is, um, well, there's always a discussion about patient comfort, but in my point of view, there are not many good arguments to argue that the arterial catheter should be placed after induction. You can easily do that before. We will soon present a randomized controlled trial 
uh, tackling this problem and we just uh, did a survey study that I didn't show. So still at least half of the catheters are placed after induction. This is something that we could easily change. A much bigger problem is the postoperative period. And this is one of the main unsolved problems in perioperative medicine. We don't know how to monitor blood pressure continuously or high frequently on normal wards after surgery. Of course, it's not a problem in the PECU or in the ICU, but on normal wards, there is basically no clinically applicable solution to monitor blood pressure continuously. And after surgery on the normal wards, we miss a lot of profound hypotension. Great. Thank you. Coming to Michael, um, you showed us that there are different mechanisms underlying hypertension, and this implies different treatments as well. But uh, playing the devil's advocate, can we not just simply treat or prevent hypertension by giving a vasopressor to all the patients from the beginning to the end? Uh, there are colleagues that say, I can prevent any hypertension by this. What do you say? Yeah, well, interestingly, um, that is missing a little bit in, in the literature, um, having a look on the side effects of norepinephrine. Um, a lot of study um, just use norepinephrine as uh, the magic bullet uh, to treat hypertension, but we don't really know about the side effects, and that's certainly some work to be done in the future. There is for the ICU population, a nice study published, um, I think, one or two years ago, the 65 study, which showed that the side effects of norepinephrine um, tolerating a certain degree of hypertension, um, but not really low um, hypertension below 60, um, does not have an unfavorable effect on outcome. Um, but I think that is something we have to tease out um, the difference between giving high doses of norepinephrine in, um, let's say, reasonably healthy patients like uh, ASA 1 or 2 patients and uh, trying to sort out the side effects of this treatment compared to um, um, dropping the blood pressure to, to 60 um, in, in this cohort. Um, but obviously, um, I think the literature quite nicely shows that um, having patients with a higher risk of complications after surgery, for example, for kidney injury, there's, um, there are some studies that show nicely that in those patients, it's really important to keep the blood pressure up. In the end, uh, if there is no evidence, I think physiology is the important thing to follow. And um, we know from, from um, clinical, but also um, lab data that giving norepinephrine in a hypovolemic patients has severe effect on the splanchnic perfusion, for example, with translocation of bacteria and, and sepsis thereafter. So in the end, I think it, it is important to find the root cause of hypertension and treat that. Excellent. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, Mr. Michael asked to Michael, um, um, monitoring for ongoing vasoplegia, a new insight into systemic pathogenity of surgery and or interventions, question mark. To me? <laughs> yeah, probably, or to anyone. <laughs> So, yeah, well, I, I think it's important. Um, uh, vasoplegia after surgery is, is uh, something we see in some patients. Um, but what is even more important, because uh, I, I think the problem in the community is, as you said, there's hypertension, so let's give a vasopressor. And that, well, you showed in, in, in your talks uh, from your hospital um, that you can quite effectively decrease cardiac output uh, in hypovolemic patients giving vasopressors, uh, which is not really a good thing. Uh, so I think it's more important to have a look on the flow parameters um, and, and treat low flow and hypovolemia with, let's say, fluids and um, inotropes. And only in those patients have really vasoplegia give uh, vasopressors to them. That would be my answer. Thank you. But by the way, I'm just thinking, so in, in, in the talks by Dr. Grundmann and uh, Dr. Professor Fla, we, we just heard about the hypertension prediction index. So this is meaning 
applying to treat hypertension before it actually occurs. Do we have any data uh, supporting that this does not cause harm? Harm, because theoretically, just imagine if the patient would not become hypertensive, giving a potential dangerous drug like norepinephrine could be dangerous. Do, do we have any any ideas about this? Yeah, I, I I'm happy to uh, to um, uh, respond on that. So uh, th this was one of our, of course, uh, safety endpoints in the the hype one trial uh, in Yama and. Uh, what was indeed um, nice to see is that prevention, because that was one of the, the dangers or people uh, hypothesis outside, is that you would probably need more fluids or more drug and, and you're just increasing maybe the blood pressure. But it is really the, the setting that you give the same amount of fluids, the same uh, uh, amount of drugs, only is that you maybe more often small interventions uh, uh, will do, uh, but in the end you will prevent it. So it's really a more personalized approach to your patient um, instead of uh, acting when it already occurs. Dr. Grundmann, anything you wanted to add? No, I agree to that. Okay, great. So uh, maybe, um, Alexander, you can also this question from the audience. Uh, William Shoemaker said in 1990, in intensive care, physicians are simple use simple interventions to treat complex problems. Today, now comes the question, what are the advanced solutions beyond norepinephrine? Treatment. And so the, the advanced solution in a way is HPI because you, you have there the advanced knowledge or insight what is occurring with your patient and then still with simple interventions, you can prevent it. So I think the advancement is not in the drug or, or, or different fluids, but it's in, in getting knowledge of what's going on in your patient, but even more, what will be going on with your patient in the next minutes. Um, and, and that, I think, is really the advancement what we're going to uh, in the next decade. Uh, and I think we're just at the beginning. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Grundmann, um, I have a question for you. you. You showed us your treatment algorithm, which, yes. which on first sight looked uh, a little bit complicated, maybe. So my question to you is, uh, how did your colleagues adopt this algorithm in their clinical practice? The, the reason behind my question is, uh, there is a study from the Cleveland Clinic that, that you might be aware of that uh, did not show an advantage of the, of the HPI compared to not using it. And the, one of the reasons was that the, comp, the, mecha, the, the algorithm that they used at that place was considered too complicated. So in, in most of the cases, the alarm was not followed by a treatment. And, and this is maybe the reason why they did not find an effect. So how, how did your colleagues uh, like the algorithm or, or work with it? Yes, as it remains a retrospective analysis, the available data did not include treatment behavior. But regarding the con conclusions from our colleagues from Cleveland Clinic, we interviewed our clinicians um, and evaluated the compliance to the protocol for internal quality management. Um, in 2019, when the study took place, we used handwritten records. So the systematic evaluation of hypertension was difficult with HPI. Our chief usually gave us feedback about the hemodynamic management postoperatively, and that resulted in a high motivation and a positive competition. So most colleagues said that they used the flowchart in the intended way. Everyone received the training in management and everyone had, of course, the possibility to contact a more experienced clinician to help with the problem, with the complexity of the flowchart. So, in our, in our workspace, it worked quite well. And no one said that it was too difficult, but it was probably because of good training in before. Yeah. So it was a, a combination of awareness and training and motivation, I guess. Yes. Great. Alexander, coming back to you, to, to your survey that you showed us. So the incidence of hypertension is, is similar in the ICU than to that in the OR, but, but the doctors in the ICU do, did not seem to, to treat it, despite that there is also evidence that, of course, it causes the same harm as, as when it occurs in the OR. So how can you explain this? 
Well, uh, that that is of course uh, very interesting, and it is an observation that if you you talk with colleagues, uh, uh, many of them have it. So uh, one of the option, the difference is of course with the OR, where you want to want to a patient really bad side, and in the ICU you've got more patients to to monitor, uh, and and of course to have to do uh, uh, several tasks. Another uh, explanation could be that that physicians, nurses, they see a blood pressure going down, but often, of course, it increases also again. So um, uh, in that way, um, uh, there is more a wait and see policy. But of course, if it deteriorates further, uh, you are really uh, uh, too late in a way. Um, so, so that are potential explanations. But I think also that uh, uh, people really need to see this HYPE 2 trial results. And, and uh, we hope, of course, that uh, our hypothesis is true, that, that we can reduce it. And, and when you show you can reduce it and you can improve patient outcome, that will help, of course, to, to get the awareness uh, across that we need to tackle this. On the other hand, in the survey, already people agree on that it's associated with uh, worse outcome. So we are there in a way already with this awareness, but we need also to have this change on the ward. Great. And um, if you consider or compare the, the ICU setting with the OR setting, we have a, a different nurse to patient ratio and particularly a different doctor to uh, patient ratio, which is one on one on the RCU on the OR, but but less so in the ICU. So what is the potential of, of HPI uh, in this particular setting of the ICU in your eyes? Yes, yeah, so, so in, in that way, it and, and that's also why we go to this neurosurgeon protocol with the HPI, including a diagnostic algorithm, you in a way uh, give the nurse more autonomy to, to act and handle uh, because, of course, indeed, uh, with with one physician uh, at many patients at the same time, you want to provide a knowledge um, and basis for the nurse to act uh, autonomously and do the right thing. And I think it's possible. Uh, we see it in practice. Um, but this is indeed where HPI, including a diagnostic algorithm, uh, uh, will help to facilitate the bedside nurses. Excellent. And I think it's an excellent closing remark because we have to close the session. We are a little bit over time already, but this is maybe due to the technical problems we had in, in the beginning. So thank you very much for all the speakers uh, for this, uh, giving their very interesting insights and results from their studies. I enjoyed uh, sharing this session very much and I learned a lot and I hope you did the same. And uh, thanks again, uh, Edwards Life Sciences for organizing this symposium. And I wish you all a nice rest of the Congress and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.